how can we get rid of those, not get rid of, but how can we get in touch with our better instincts, our better values, you know, instead of the instinct to dominate and to get power for ourselves, how can we get, you know, in touch with the instinct to cooperate and seek the best for each other, you know? Cause that's what, that's it. That's how we win. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night, listening to The Cool Table. And today, we are in the cut with um, a Canadian hip-hop legend. Shad, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, you know, we don't have the ice cream today. We, we uh, went smoothie gang. So can you give us a rundown of what you're throwing into your body right now? Yeah. So I'm a big believer that if it doesn't taste bad, it's not good for you. So like, that's how I do my smoothies. It's like, there's not something green. And so I got some avocado in here, hemp hearts, banana, yogurt, water, blueberry. Okay, I saw it. There was no kale, so I couldn't make that happen, but. It would be. Everything would else be. green. Oh my. I think it's only fitting that we take a, a step back in time. And I was I was trying to think to when is the first time that I saw your music or heard of you? And I would say it's probably 09, 010, which I was in high school that time, so a very long time ago. Um, but it was yeah. the Fresh Prince, the old Prince still lives at home. That was the first video yeah. I saw. I thought that was like the coolest thing um, at the time. Can you, tell me, can you go back in time for me and just tell me about how that came together? Because I, I remember when I was like 16 and yeah. I saw that, that was it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so that that was an early release for me. That was for my second album. And the first time, my first album was just independently made. So, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't make any videos really. Um, actually, I didn't make any videos at all. Because you got to think, you know, my first album was 05. So, you know, the technologies to be able to make videos, just they weren't accessible, right? So the second album, though, I got um, a grant to make a video. Much music at the time was given out grants to make videos. Um, but, you know, you could apply to get, get one. And, and so uh, we got this grant, this song called the Old Prince is at Home. It's like a song about, you know, living at home with your folks and that kind of thing, saving money. And uh, the director had the idea to make this video um, based on the intro for the for the Fresh Prince theme song. And um, it somehow came together, you know, like we, we got this grant, so we had a budget, but it wasn't a crazy budget, um, but it was enough to scout locations. And we found a house that looked like, you know, Uncle Phil rest in peace his house. And, uh, and so we shot the doorbell scene in front of that where he will, you know, swirls his head and all that. Um, uh, have some friends that are visual artists so they were able to take this studio wall and do basically all the graffiti that's in the one scene where he's kind of sitting on a throne type chair and spinning around anyways it ended up you know looking like this um not exactly the same you know but in a charming way not quite there you know what I mean like like you know a, a good a good length of the way there to, to, to recreating it. But, you know, when it misses the mark, it was kind of charming at the same time. So yeah, I have fond memories of doing that. I made that video with, um, yeah, a couple of directors that are good friends. So that was very cool. Now that, that was, that was really cool to see. Cause I hadn't really seen at least anyone Canadian do anything creatively like that before. Musically I'd heard stuff that was different that I liked. Like, I remember like Jay Diggs, Rochester, like they're all from like back in those days. But that was the first thing I seen visually that I was like, oh, that's cool. And then the second one was Rose Garden. And I remember Rose Garden because yeah. that was the, that was like, you know, kind of trying to guess where you were in the city. That was like, you know, that was me remembering that video. I'm like, okay, do I know where that neighborhood is? Do I recognize those garages. 
tell us about uh, Rose Garden. Like, you know, what you remember from that time. Yeah. So that was a situation where we, we didn't get a grant to make the video. So, you know, we had to really think, get creative. Like, what can we do that's interesting? And um, so in terms of music videos, like the director and I were both big fans of Spike Jones, who, when we were in high school, was making very creative videos. Sometimes he'd have a big budget and he'd do something like Beastie Boys Sabotage or um, Drop by the Far Side, you know? Um, and, and when he had a small budget, he would do like crazy with Fat Boy Slim, like where it was actually just him break dancing in the street with like a handy cam, you know what I mean? So we loved the feel of his videos. So that one is based on one of his videos. It's based on Drop by the Far Side, but we tried to do it in a lower budget way. Um, and he came up with this idea of the song, it goes forwards and backwards, but the, but the imagery lines up with the lyrics either way. Um, and so that's kind of how we put And yeah, you know, we shot it in the alleyway in Toronto. So it's like, it's very Toronto. It's very downtown. And um, so, yeah, that's how that came together. And it ended up just like fitting the spirit of the song, you know, like it's a kind of a soulful, warm kind of song. And we shot it on a nice day in the back alleys and it just felt right. For sure. Y'all y'all got the best sun on that day, like without a doubt. I was like, this looks like the best weather I've seen in a long time um, in this video. So 100% agree with that. Now, I want to talk about the new project. And I feel like before we do any of that, you should probably explain to everyone this whole thing with the circle and everything disintegrating. So explain to everyone kind of this, the circle and how that is part of the project. Yeah, so what inspired this album for me was um, thinking about life, thinking about people's lives around me, thinking about the state of the world. One day this image occurred to me of a circle when I was thinking about all that. And I saw this circle start to break into different pieces. And then those pieces starting to float away from the whole and eventually kind of disintegrating and disappearing. And it occurred to me that that image is like a metaphor for what's happening to our humanity in a lot of ways. You know, the, all the, the pieces of the circle to me represent the different aspects of our life. So whether that be um, work life, apologies, you can hear my kids a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, you know, those, those pieces of the circle represent the different aspects of our life. So for example, your work life, for example, your relationship to nature, your relationship to other people, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, it seemed to me when I thought about it, all of these different things are under threat. You know, if you think about work life these days, work is more precarious than ever, you know, more scarce than ever. If you think about our connection with each other, well, as it's often said, you know, these times are more divided than ever. And, uh, you know, with social media and everything is more tense than ever. And it's, it's more and more difficult to form relationships, real strong in-person connections, you know? <laughs> So that image, that metaphor ended up guiding my thinking in terms of how to make the album. Like I thought, what if I made an album about our humanity and about connection and each song sort of centered on one of those pieces of the circle, you know? So there's a song called Work, it's about work. You know, there's a song called Storm that's about our relationship to the natural world, you know, and it goes, there's layers to it. And I come at the songs from different angles, but that's how I thought about making the album, you know, is this, our humanity and connection and wholeness and this thing, you know, that we're losing and, um, and just breaking it down piece by piece, you know, um, but also trying to do it in a way where I'm also trying to imagine putting the, putting the picture back together, putting the circle back together, you know, so I tried to make it um tried to infuse some of that hope and hope into it as well I, I was literally going to say that you you're asking all those questions all over the project but it's not bleak at the same time and I always think back to the circle and everything breaking apart because the thought of that is bleak of like these things breaking apart disconnecting from them them disintegrating but that's not how the project sounds and so it's like, I, I kind of love that, that you can ask the questions, but yeah. it's not overbearing and 
things like that. So I thought the, the circle was important to explain uh, from that sense, but you wrote it before the pandemic. I know everyone kind of thinks everything as a pandemic, but we live we lived before the pandemic. That is that is a thing that happened. So, you know, talk about, I guess, if you can go back in time before the pandemic, before the Panzerati, and what was making you notice these things and giving you that vision. Yeah, you know, yeah, to me, all this stuff was definitely happening before the pandemic, you know, like the tensions to me, they were already there, you know, the, the, um, it's not hard to look around the city and see the inequality. Um, to see the gap between the haves and the have nots growing. Um, it's not hard to see pre pandemic people struggling with social isolation, you know, and feeling lonely and feeling disconnected. You know, we were already living a lot online, you know, and then we just had to be completely online, but we were already living a lot online, you know, like I could, I could look, I went. You know, I could look out my window at night and see, you know, mainly Uber Eats people do dropping off food, nobody going outside, you know what I mean? Like, so all these things were already happening. You know, the, the, the environment, you know, climate crisis, it's like the, that was pretty, you know, that was, that's been going on. So I saw all this stuff before that. The pandemic put this new layer to things. It, um, the way I say it is it, it like it hit the gas pedal on all these trends, you know, we were already socially isolating. We were already more disconnected. It just hit the gas pedal on that. Um, we work was already becoming this hustle and, and gig economy culture. And then the pandemic straight up shut down entire industries. So it's, it, it, it inequality was already, bad and then the pandemic spiraled out of control so the pandemic hit the gas pedal on all these trends you know really hit fast forward that's how i see it and i i feel like also we're just really divided as a, a people in terms of how we how we look at things I feel, I feel like you know it's a very very big division in how people are perceiving what is actually going on and the and the part they play in it and you know you you have this line that you said in another another interview, and you said, "I hope the album is suggesting we need each other." And I thought that was like so powerful because I feel like you know whatever you think the answer is to the circle breaking apart, um, to us doing it together is part of yeah. this part of the solution. And it's crazy you said that in the interview because I don't remember what the question was, but I thought that was powerful. But it led me to this bar, and this bar I need you to explain because it's one of it's one of my one of my favorites from this project you have here you said only those that don't believe in power have the power that can lead to peace mm. man well first of all thank you for listening you know and thank you for um taking it in on that level that those lyrics are some of the most important to me on the album i wish almost i phrased them a little bit different just to make it clear what i'm saying because what i'm saying is um only those that only those that believe in power in the sense of domination over other people only those that see that we need each other and in fact you know what i mean like it's not about it's not about winning for one person like cuz if another person because we're so connected another person loses, we lose, you know, it's like the saying, no, no one's free until we're all free. The only, you know, the great ones in history understood that, I think. The ones that really, on a level big or small, you know, like, achieved peace for themselves, for their communities, it's like, they understood that, that it, it is collective, man, like, that's the nature of our species that we've lost touch with. We're such an individualistic society, you know? We've become a society that's, a, that's about that, like seek power for yourself. If everybody seeks power for themselves, somehow that's magically gonna work out. That's literally the philosophy of our society. It's like, <laughs> no, you know? For real. 
it's like obviously that doesn't that doesn't work you know i was reading that book um there's a book called sapiens very popular book that's just about the history of humanity you know human civilization and uh the author explains that actually humans are like in terms of animals we're like trash except for the fact that we can cooperate you know what i mean we're not fast we're not strong we're not you know very well adapted to so many like so many climates so many things what makes us the apex is our ability to cooperate you know like like other animals they can have a band of like i don't know max 100 you know we can we live in a society of 35 million people that abide by a social contract you know that's what makes us you know and that's just across space if you think about it across time, it's like we collaborate across time. We take the knowledge from all the knowledge from the past and we add to it. Like human, that's all we have is each other. Like that's why we're great. And we've lost touch with that. And so I really do believe that, you know, like to your question about that bar, you know, like that is something I try to remind myself all the time. This is about and now we're getting down to the spiritual level, you know, it's like, how can we, how can we, um, how can we get rid of those, not get rid of, but how can we get in touch with our better instincts, our better values, you know, instead of the instinct to dominate and to get power for ourselves, how can we get, you know, in touch with the instinct to cooperate and, seek the best for each other you know because that's what that's it that's how we win mm -hmm. you know i think we see it time and time again throughout history it's like that's it's the collective power that does it you know yeah and, and i i think as well even thinking of our idea of what power means because i think collective power in terms of actually you know bring up your community and having peace for yourself and others we don't look at that as power in the same way yeah. as dominating someone else or being competitive and i think that you know that That's piece it. for your that piece for yourself and your and your people should be looked at a version of power and i think that would do so much for us because you're right the togetherness that you speak about is not something people are even striving for and i think that's you know kind of where we're, that, we're at right it, now it, I, yeah exactly you know like when we look at our our um neighbors south of the border it's exactly that situation right it's like red and blue and both are just trying to win for themselves they don't care about the whole thing that's the issue right like they have complete gridlock in their government like nothing can happen because they literally don't care about the whole thing anymore blue wins blue's like sick we're not working with red we're just it's all for us red wins it's like yeah no even if you have a great idea that's going to help everybody you know no we don't want to do it why because you said it <laughs> you know <laughs> like we gotta we gotta get out of that mentality you know like um and you know i also think about it on the level of um i think about it on the level of the individual so there's a lot of conversation now about like mental health, for example, right? And um, self-care, right? Which is cool, but in our society, in our individualistic society, the pressure stays on an individual to care for their own mental health, care for their own. It's like, yes, the individual has responsibility, but this doesn't work without community. And it, it just ends up burdening people even more, you know, a lot of times when you say, all right, you go do your five minute meditation, you go do your self care, whatever you need to do. It's like, yes, that stuff is important, but we'll never actually be healthy. Mentally without community, without community, you know. I think I think I think that's huge, and I and I've, I've been even, yeah, and I've been realizing that kind of 
even in my own circles, like, you know, I have a group of friends where we're basically family to each other, but we might not see each other as often, but we'll talk every day or, you know, spend a little bit of time. And we're just like, you know, we're not going to be as strong as we need to be if we don't build each other up, you know, and, and it's, it's kind of the same way. It's like, if, if all these basketball teams, you know, <laughs> didn't practice with each other, but they just played runs separately, you know, they're not going to be the great team. So I, we got to kind of treat ourselves um, in that same way. This is a, the last question about that project before we talk some basketball and some hip hop evolution. Um, you yes. said out of touch was the thesis for this project. Um, I, 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 I'm I very happy to hear that because that's a great um, great song in, in itself, but a great song to kind of launch from. And I think that if there was one song to kind of mm. help people understand the project, that would be a good one uh, to choose. So talk about that being the thesis for the album. That's it, man. Like when I was writing it, um, I was thinking about, well, the, the phrase that touched came to me, right? It sums up everything we've been talking about in terms of that picture of the circle and things coming apart, right? It's, it's we're out of touch, you know, in every sense. We're out of touch. And so I thought, I actually deliberately set out to write that song as that kind of, this is the snapshot of the album. This is the thesis. This is the song that if you wanted to explain what I'm thinking about these days, this is the song, you know? Um, so lyrically, it, it touches on all kinds of different things that I expand on in the rest of the album, you know? But you know, touch on it to mental health, to um, even food. You know, the second verse starts, how do we reattach the roots? I don't mean no metaphor. I'm talking about these packaged foods, mass produced. Who's the most impacted group? Guess, we the black and blue. Really, it's a question that's connected to the facts and truth, lands and plants and passion fruits, like getting down to the level of the environment and stuff too. Like I grew up in, in London, which is like, you know, mid-sized city. You grew up, uh, uh, you know, around here. It's like, we never got to get in touch with the soil. You know what I mean? And and we're out of touch with that. So, and then I, you know, I touch on technology a bit and connections to other people. So really it's like the, the lyrics kind of scan everything, you know, and then, um, and then musically too, like we were saying, it's like, it, it is upbeat and it is soulful and it is, it, it, I think the song has a hopeful spirit to it, even as I'm laying out all the issues that, you know, that's what I was going for with the song. And so in a way that also to me is a microcosm of the album. Yeah, I like it because um, you talk about all these things you're out of touch with, but some of these things are some things that people may not have a relationship with in the first place. We're talking about how being disconnected to the earth and your relationship with that. Some people may not even have a relationship with the earth at all in their mind. So it's like that out of touch is like, oh, I'm super out of touch. I don't even have this relationship at all. So it's like the so many different things yeah. that you mentioned makes it like there's no way for you to feel like it's not you. You know, you may feel like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm strong here, but it's like not. Nah, there's no way that you reach everything across. Yeah, exactly. Because again, um, again, it's, it's a conversation of the individual and the collective. It's like, we can't, you know, something in our society tells us, okay, you work on you getting in touch with everything, man. It's like, no, it's our systems. It's our society. It's not, you know, we have to fix it together. We have to, you know, we have to do it together because it just doesn't work on an individual level. You know, I can try, you know, I can plant a little garden in my front yard and I can, I can try, I can do all this stuff. It's good. It's healthy. It's good. You know, it's part of the solution for sure. But, you know, what I'm really trying to drive towards too is, uh, you know, we have to do it together. A hundred, 145%. Now, this is one of my favorite things from this whole Panzerati we've been going through was seeing you post about all these 90s games you were watching. And 
like from watching the last dance i probably watched that three or four times since then but my favorite part was thinking about all those other 90s teams that got talked about we know about the bulls a lot but seeing the sonics get a shout out even the jazz getting their little bit of love the suns so which which team in the 90s did you like think back to and you were like oh forgot about how good this team was man so yeah Honestly, one of the first things that hit me when the, when the pandemic started was I'm going to miss basketball. Like I'm going to miss watching basketball. So I start like some people were panic buying toilet paper. I was panic searching YouTube for old games. Like I don't care. Like I can take a shower, but I can need some basketball. Like, so um, one of the first teams that came to mind was actually the Warriors when they had Tim Hardaway. DMT. Truly the father of the crossover. And so I found some of his old games and his crossover was even nastier than I remembered. It was disgusting. It was disgusting. He would do this two, they called it the UTEP two-step. It was like, boom, boom. You know, now after Iverson, it's just one way, you know, like, and it's, a, and it's more of a carry. It's definitely like more of a carry. And, you know, you hang it out, you hang it out there to the right, let's say, and then you really fake hard to the right, then you bring it back. Mm-hmm. Tim was like this lightning quick two direction, hard right, let's say through his legs, and then hard left back and um people would be nowhere to be found nowhere to be found and just nowhere to be found because he because he would do it let's say just like hard right and then you know he's so quick like he's gone right so then you have to react once he goes hard right and then he crosses it right back it was just absurd so i was watching a lot of that um and then, uh, then I got into the Suns. I was like, man, the Suns were such a funny, weird team. You know, like Barkley. How do you explain Barkley? Like the guy dominated as a six-four power forward. Unreal, unreal. It was unreal, unreal, and out of shape. Like six-four, <laughs> out of shape. <laughs> he, he makes Draymond Green look like Kawhi Leonard, like in terms of body composition, <laughs> like. It's it's actually crazy. And it's like Tim Hardaway, the crossover, I feel like the way he did it, a lot of guys probably couldn't do today because he's actually dribbling on the fingertips and moving quickly. When I feel like the hesitation dribbles now is how guys are getting this stuff off. And the other person I thought of a lot was Hakeem with those Rockets teams. And I, like, I, I, I'm a huge, huge Hakeem fan, but I, feel, I forgot about Clyde being part of the second chip. Cause I, I, you know, I think Clyde's a bit overrated. I'm happy he made the top 75, of course, but you know, I do think he's a bit overrated, but thinking about him getting that chip, I you know totally forgot that he was part of that team. Yeah. Yeah. Yo, the Rockets, I watched the Rockets game and uh, I forgot about Hakeem. First of all, on defense, he was like the best defensive player I've ever seen. Literally, literally, I was like, this guy is right there with, you know, I, because I have the bias too of, you know, okay, the guy, the game now, the guys are better, right? Like they, they kind of are. But watching Akeem, I was like, this guy is at least as good as Anthony Davis on defense. And Anthony Davis is a silly defender, you know? Yeah. But the way he could move his feet, the timing on the block shots, it was just, it was just crazy. And then, yeah. And then offensively too, like the footwork, I mean, you know, he's still schooling guys on the footwork every summer. Facts. Facts. Still teaching. Still teaching. He's still, he's still teaching. So yeah, they were fun to watch and they were, um, they shot a lot more threes too than I remember. Like we think mm-hmm. of this era as, oh, like people didn't shoot threes before. It's like, no guys did shoot threes. It was just, Guys shot it from everywhere. You know, now you only shoot threes or dunk. You know what I mean? Man, now, now listen, now it's crazy. Like, as much as I love Jordan Poole, Jordan Poole it has to be must-watch TV every night because he'll hit one crazy and then take two that <laughs> miss the whole entire arena. 
right afterwards. So now you're absolutely right about that. Um, two, two more things in the talking ball. Who's your team right now outside of the Raps? Like, is there a team that you're kind of watching a little bit more this year? Uh, trying to think of who I'm paying attention to. I'm paying attention to Golden State again. Like, the first couple games, just they're moving the ball in that Golden State way again. Yeah, it's looking like, scary. It's, it's, it's scary when they start moving the ball like that, where it really is just – it's just threes and dunks. You know, yeah. like, they're, they're scary. Um, I still think, though – I mean, we'll see what happens with Kyrie, but I still think that that three-headed monster in Brooklyn, if they can put it together, there you can't beat that that's three guys that's three guys who can't be stopped one-on-one there there is no one who can stop any of those three guys one-on-one plus you know let them spot up so i really think it's everything is a moot point if those guys are playing i i agree with that and even even the first game um against brooklyn I mean, against Milwaukee, I felt the same way for this reason. None of those guys are scared of Giannis. In the, in the series last year, they would get Giannis and go at him, which is pretty disrespectful, but they would just go at him. And then there's only one Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday is the only one who has a chance of guarding any of them, and it's yeah. only him. Chris Middleton and KD were guarding each other in the game, and KD scoring everything, locking up Chris Middleton. I just felt so bad for the guy. I'm like, yeah, there's nothing you could do about, about that, so... But the Warriors are my team, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, somehow, you know, and then the problem is, too, if if two of them don't have the ball and they're spotting up. Yeah, you can't leave them. You can't leave James Harden. Like, James Harden hasn't even shot an open three in, like, five years. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. open three. It's like, come on. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, no, I think they're unstoppable. Yeah. What about you? Who, who else are you watching? Um, Golden State's my, my team as well. I'm, a, I'm also a Laker fan, but I'm not a big Westbrook guy, so I, this is like an iffy season for me to watch. But I'm a huge Luka fan. Luka, Luka is my guy. I'm waiting yeah, for them Luka. to finally have a good season. So that's my guy right there. I'll say this about Luka. Every time I see Luka, I'm like, there's no way that guy doesn't win a championship. There's just no way. Yeah, he, he's, he, he's, he's probably... I would say the most unguardable player other than KD to me, because like what he did to Patrick Beverly is like, you know, and is, is insane. He couldn't stay by him. And if he did, he just ran him over. And it's like, yeah. who, who are you, who are you going to put on him? Like Kevin Garnett in his prime? Like, you know, he's, he's staying with everybody. He's running yep. them over, hitting every shot. Like it's insane. Yep. He hunts, he hunts, he hunts his mismatch. And then you're finished. So, finished. and he's so patient with hunting that mismatch that you need five guys that can guard Luca. Literally. You literally need five guys who can guard Luca because he just needs one to exploit. He can take you in the post, you're finished. He can just not even get by you, just get you on his hip and then change his pace on the drive and hit some kind of shot in the lane. Of course, he'll hit the three. Plus, he's a big game player. Also, now he's got those weird Dirk shots in his repertoire. Can't block those. Can't block those. He'll pick you apart as a passer. And he's a big game player. Yeah, he's not scared of the moment at all. Like that, and that, that's, that is a thing that I, I'm so confident in, that I'm like, you know, any big game, he's showing up. You can just guarantee a 40 piece. No, no, no question. So yeah, that's, no that's, yeah, that's, that's he, the guy I'm watching. He's winning a championship in his career. If he has one other piece, it's multiple, it's multiple chips because he loves the big moment. The way I always think about the playoffs is this, like a guy like Luca can win you three games. Yeah. You just need somebody else to win you one game. At the least, he alone will win you two games. Minimum. Minimum. Yeah. So it's just a matter of a guy 
getting you, you know, two more games. That was like Braun in his prime. Braun in his prime is like, I'm going to, I mean, in the East, he's like, I'll win every game. I'll win the yeah. whole East. <laughs> but, you know, once it's the finals, he's like, I can win us. Two games, at least. I can win us like two, three games. You know, even when, what was the year? 2015, Golden State. He won two games. Yeah, literally. Yeah, literally by himself. By himself. Just give me somebody other than, you know, <laughs> bless him. But, JR, you know, it's like, give me somebody. <laughs> other than other than Delhi, give me someone who could dribble off, not off their give, foot. Give me somebody besides Della Bado. Like, give me somebody that can actually win a game. That's when he had Kyrie. Exactly. Okay. We're, good. We're good, you know? So I see Luca as that guy. Like, he is so terrifying. He's scary. terrifying. He, he is scary. I love the league right now. Like, there's so many interesting, exciting players, you know. I think Luca is, like, the scariest guy. I still think Steph is the most heartbreaking guy. He sure. really de- he demoralizes you because you might guard him perfectly for 23 seconds of that shot clock. It's not enough. It's not enough. <laughs> Ayo, it's crazy at this point. There was a the there's a preseason game, and he had three possessions in a row where he just scored layups. And the panic that he caused from the, the defense was insane. But the layups he the layups he was scoring were real fillets. Like two guys jumping at him and just and he'll and he'll and he'll still make it. And it looks smooth as ever, just off the glass. And you're like, yeah, what are you gonna do? He's the only guy that I've seen like create this body language you know because guys they don't want to give up they don't want to show their emotion when they're guarding Steph right but mm-hmm. I've seen guys literally just like throw up their hands after he'll make a shot just like what but this isn't fair you know what I'm what supposed to do <laughs> what am I supposed to do <laughs> oh my yeah I know he's you know? he's 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 gross that uh three he had I think yesterday from like the logo 25 yeah, points in the quarter. No, he's he's yeah, we're we're a Steph Curry household here, so 100 percent I'm with you on that one. Let's talk about hip hop evolution. I, I've been yeah. kind of waiting to ask you this since I watched the show. Mm-hmm. So this is oh, this question is years in the making. Do you tell these people that you rap? That's my that's yeah. my question. No, you don't tell anyone. No. No, I don't. Um I don't. I, I really try to just make sure this was about them and make sure like, like they knew, um, they might've heard that I rap. Um, and I feel like we would only tell them that to, um, just to kind of indicate that the person you're talking to is going to understand what you're saying. Right. So that they don't feel if in any way it helps them feel like, you know, they're talking to someone they can actually talk to and they don't need to hold back on the storytelling because maybe I won't understand. It's like, no, I understand. So, but I tried to keep, I tried to separate the two, you know what I mean? And make sure that they felt, they understood this is about them and their story, you know? I always thought that because there's a couple of clips where someone's explaining like the intricacies of writing a bar or writing lines. And I can hear you, I can hear you some sometimes in the in the room being like, yeah, yeah. And in my head, I'm like, they have no idea. I'm like, you're you're explaining to him, but I, I it makes it makes um complete, complete total sense. Yeah. Last season, it ended off with 50 TI and Wayne. That's like, you know, that's my that's my prime where I where I grew up. Where where would the next season start? Where would it kind of go right after that? Um, right after 50 TI and Wayne. Yeah, so. I guess there'd be a few different ways to look at it. Like I don't write the show, so it wouldn't be my my call. But if I was given my input, I would take it from there to the internet. You know, that was mixtape era, right? And still still on CDs, you know what I mean? Like mixtape on CDs. And to me, from there, the the hip hop went to the internet and in a new way that really transformed the music. So um, I think it would be interesting to do an episode getting into, um, trying to think of who, 
Lil B. Oh yeah. Um, just like just like the internet, you know what I mean, and mm-hmm. and what guys started doing on the internet. Um, Soldier Boy. Soldier Boy, Wiz Khalifa, that type of. Wiz Khalifa. Yep. Um, anyone that came up, you know, SoundCloud era, that era, like um, all of that stuff to me, like deserves an episode because it changed, it changed things, right? Like Lil B make uploading those songs that are just, they're just clickbait, you know, but it worked. Right. It worked. It was like, you know, cause that, that was a big change in the, in the mentality because before that everyone was trying to make their Illmatic. Yeah. And Lil B was the first guy to be like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm not trying to make anything great. This is, it's all about volume, you know? Just take the music. Just... It is, this is volume, 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 volume. Like, people weren't doing that before that. They would, they would take forever to try to make the perfect album. That's what it is, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, no, no, no. You just take a song, you call it Ellen DeGeneres. That way it gets a lot of clicks. <laughs> no throw back throw back and you said something about technology playing a huge part in the growth of the show now oh. i thought about that while thinking about it going to the next next season which would be the internet i agree with you in that sense but as well i think um in terms of the visuals i remember that was a time when you know people are having eight videos off of a mixtape and it's like talk about what we what we said you know 10 years ago when yeah. you needed to have a grant for a video and it wasn't the same like you know, this this was a different time when it's like, you know, Currency puts out a song on the Monday, the video is out on Tuesday, and it's not connected to any project whatsoever. That's so it. it's like such a different time. That's it. Such, such a different time. Yeah, where you could go, yeah, you know, maybe you can afford a half decent camera and a drone and, uh, you know what I mean? And boom, you know. There you go. And, and, and there you go. Uh, it'd be cool to do something international too, because that's changed a lot mm. from, you know, obviously Toronto influence, UK influence, um, the continent in the last, you know, five years, having more of a presence in hip hop. It's like, that would be really cool to be able to touch on like the globe, how it's become more, so much more global, you know? went from New York and New York and LA and the South having to even fight to get respect to all of a sudden this, this is a fully global thing and artists from all over the world are working together. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that has to be, has to be the way it goes. I, and I, I love to feel the different kind of uh, global sections, how they like rotate and how they travel, you know, thinking about how, you know, music from Africa travels, how music from the UK travels, music from Toronto travels, um you know these things now are traveling you know across international borders not just you know toronto music making it to ottawa this is now toronto music being played in brazil or wherever so yeah Yeah, it's it's crazy um you know even streaming like streaming services did not exist until i don't know 2011 2012 yeah maybe later than that like yeah so that, that that's a that, that's a crazy one. Yeah, okay. I'm I'm excited now. That there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot. We we have no we have no plans at the moment, mm. but if we if we got to do it, there would be a lot there, you know, and, and that might be the way to make sense to look at it because um a lot of the artists since 2005 too, it's like it's hard to talk about their legacies because they're so they're not done, you know, like Drake is still on a run j cole still on a run kendrick you know like so you can't tell their story yet in the same way that um careers used to be shorter right like yeah when we, when we talk to um dmc about their, they were the, the you know big stars of rap um but their run was like two albums, three albums. Yeah, I was gonna say three so, albums, basically. Yeah. After that, they were finished. You know, I asked um DMC. Yep. 
Yeah, I asked I asked DMC at one point. I said, "What did you think when you heard Rock Kim?" And he said, "Oh, I knew we were done." That's amazing. That's amazing. And he wasn't wrong, you know. No, like, super wrong. Yeah, super right. Like just so different, so different. So different. Another level. Okay, that's it. You know. Mm, not you're right. Careers are definitely longer now. Because here's what I said um, a couple weeks ago. Chance is, is a good example because Chance is like people didn't love his last album. He's still a big star, but you know he kind of has to bring himself back to that level. But Chance has four good projects already that are yep. like solid, solid projects. And it's like most artists have 15 year careers can't give you four projects that you could stand with. And exactly. You know, it's like, I think that that's what has some of these artists living longer because if you have four good projects, your set may never, you may never add nothing new to your set, but four good projects is a set you can play for a long time. So it's exactly. like, exactly, yeah. exactly. And you know, and there's new frontiers, right? In hip hop. So um, also when it started, it was super, super, super youth culture. Like it was just kids. Um, Chuck D very famously when public enemy was starting, he was like 20 or 21 and he thought he was too old. That's crazy. To be starting because hip hop was so, you know, the music of teenagers. Um, and now we have these, all these new frontiers, right? Like Jay-Z, who is 50 or whatever now you know what i mean like all these new frontiers exist in hip-hop that like oh okay i guess you can be this old and still be rapping or have your career go longer and there's there's fans of hip-hop right like you see with the verses it's like there is a lot of old heads a lot <laughs> a lot you know, and it's it's not what people thought it would be where it's like, oh, okay, you get a certain age and you move on from hip hop, you're not interested anymore. It's like, no, there's hundreds of thousands of people that are like, yes, Big Daddy Kane, KRS, let's go. You know, it's what they grew up with and it's what they still love. So, you know, that's all new frontiers, you know? A hundred, a hundred percent. This question we ask everybody on the show and they say the top five people in your life help make you who you are. Now your top five can be a two or it can be a 10, but who are the yeah. top five people in your life that help you be you? Yeah. Um, in no particular order, um, my wife, because to, the, to our whole conversation about we, you know, and um, that's a big thing that I believe uh, that I that makes me believe in marriage, you know, because marriage is really the starting place of like, OK, it's not me anymore. It's we. And we have to find a way to share our lives, you know, even as we're individuals. We have to develop some kind of rhythm of sharing our life. I need to tell you what's on my mind. It's part of what this thing is and vice versa. And you got to always know what's going on with me. If I'm well, you're well. If you're not well, I'm not well. It's like we really, you practice that. So in terms of who makes me who I am, it's like she makes me who I am. Um, on that note, I'll say my I feel bad picking one daughter, not the other, but like the older one, one is a baby. She's one year old. So, you know, our relationship is cool, but it's like, you know, <laughs> but the older one, what I'm learning from the three-year-old is, is how to just be, you know, like we don't have to entertain each other when we hang out. We can just sit on the couch and like, and she doesn't care about my work. She doesn't care about any of that. It's just, we just sit there. She just likes to sit beside me and I like to sit beside her, you know? So I'm learning about just like how to be present with myself and with an, in the company of another person with no expectations, with no um, 
with no sense of responsibility like I have to entertain you or you have to entertain me it's just like no just just being together is cool that's all we want as human beings you know we just kind of want to be able to be together and and um and feel okay in each other's company so she would be up there um my older sister we're a year and a half apart in age so we've always been close and when I think about who knows me best she knows me best you know my my wife and I have been together for a long time now she knows me very well but but my sister's seen all those moments you know like my wife and I, we still, we still met later in life. I met her when I was like 30, right? So that's a lot to explain to a person versus my sister who just witnessed it all. In some ways, she knows me better than I know myself, you know? So she would be up there. Um, who else? My manager probably would be up there. You know, because he's been side by side with me through, you know, adult life and career. And then, uh, yeah, and then my best friend I grew up with who actually um, teaches at the school where we went to junior high together. Now, he would be he would be high up on the list. He's a, he was a year ahead of me. So, like junior high ball like he was a, he was a starter grade eight I was his backup point guard I was his understudy his Fred Van Vliet I was his Fred Van Vliet until he moved till he moved on you know um so he would be up there too yeah I, I, I like that list a lot I like that list a lot we I love doing the top five because you know just have those people close to you is is so so important and then having people that you feel like know you because i i don't i've known people that don't have that and i feel like sometimes take it for granted so it's so so great to hear that um i, this, I love the way that, i love the way that you put that question too you know like top five people that you know know you and put you in touch with who you are right like that's so you named it right there that's it you know, when you have those big decisions to make, when you have things that you're going through, it's like you want to have that. I think of them like mirrors, accurate mirrors, good mirrors. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And it's, and it's like, it helps you feel like yourself because, you know, people always say being comfortable is kind of the enemy of success, but there is yeah. a space between being comfortable and then trying to grow and what yeah. actually feels like you and those people who are close to you. Um, when you're with them or when you talk to them, you're like, okay, I feel like myself. This yes. feels like something I can do. Um, I'm very interested to see answer for, answer for this one because the last person I talked to said that they were a turtle in a past life for this question, which is completely left to where this question is even going. But when people get $100 million, we see them by animals. Yep. Mike Tyson with his tiger, Justin Bieber with his monkey, Michael Jackson with his monkey. So when you get $100 million, what animal do you have in mind? Okay, there's there's two. One, I've always liked llamas. I don't know why I find them funny. Okay. I like llamas. But you know, we're talking about a hundred million dollars. Like you gotta like flex, right? <laughs> so <laughs> definitely a gorilla. Ooh, that's definitely hard. a gorilla because my family's from Rwanda and we have the mountain gorillas. That's like one of our main things. Mm -hmm. So it's like a flex, but it's also cultural, you know? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a flex. Having a gorilla roll around with you at any point in time, like your, your, your chain is safe. Let's just say that you don't go to your, your chain is absolutely safe. I, I like that one. And then llamas, llamas are a vibe. I feel like yeah. llamas are like, you know, camel, camels with personality. That's, that's, yeah. that's how I look at them. That, exactly. I've always like, I've always liked them. I've always felt like I related to them. You know, like they have to walk up these mountains in the Andes. Like they don't seem excited about it, but they're also just like, it's cool. Like it's my lot in life. <laughs> I respect that. I kind of like relate to that. I like that one. It's my llama life. 
it's just my cool. llama life. You know, I carry this stuff up the hills. It's not my fate. Like, obviously, it's not great, but it's. I, I got nothing to do. <laughs> I got nothing else to do. Seems to help these people. So, you know. <laughs> oh, I like that one a lot. Um, this yeah. is this is our our last question, and we do a section on the show called Wednesday Wisdom. It's hosted by our boy Brandon Gibbs, and every week we look for a motivational quote or saying. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, motivational quote or saying, either something that you repeat to yourself or you share with the people around you that keeps you going throughout the week. Mm. That's a great question. I'm trying to think. Wednesday wisdom. Um, there's so many there's so many there's so many options the one that that is coming to mind right now for some reason is something that um a professor said in fourth year that has stayed with me for uh you know 17 years now and i don't even know if anyone else in the class noticed when he said it okay but it was a fourth year uh, business strategy class. And um, he was talking in the context of uh, this company he worked with. He was a consultant in his career before teaching, like a super consultant. So basically he would go into failing companies and try to turn them around. And in the context of talking about that one company that he worked with that he helped turn around, he said, you don't have to be very good to be the best. Wow. That was a good one. That was a good one. And I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but like, I, I understood what he was saying, you know, and in the context of the company he was talking about, he's like, you know, it was failing. They were trying to do too many things. They were doing like a hundred things. Most of them didn't work. So he ended up scaling them down to like the one part of the company that they actually did okay. And then after five years, they kind of learned how to do it a bit better. And then one of their main competitors wanted out. So they acquired them. So then they were bigger. And then five years after that, suddenly they were like the best company in the region at that thing. And he's like, and it's not like we were great. You know, we were failing 10 years before that. Well, you know, we just kind of focused and a couple things went our way and then suddenly we're the best, you know? And I was like, damn, that is really true. You know, like you, if you focus on what it is you have to offer, even as you're still a human being that's imperfect and makes mistakes and is not, you know, but if you focus on what you have to offer, what you have to contribute, what you have the most passion and energy towards, um doing and you and you stay doing it long enough the pretenders kind of start to fall by the wayside the people that weren't really that committed start to fall by the wayside meanwhile you're getting better suddenly you're the best you know and you're just like i guess i'm the best you know <laughs> like that's, that's so when you do the Jordan shrug. That's when you do the Jordan shrug. It's just like, okay, like, I guess I'm the best, you know? I think it is, a lot of it is those two things. You really are um, coming, from a, coming from a good place. It's like this never ending well of energy towards what you're doing. And then, and then you just are sticking with it as most people don't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're a couple I, I, breaks. You're a couple breaks from some success, you know. I th I like that one a lot, especially to to end on because I've never heard a quote like that. Um, in terms of, you know, you don't you don't have to be that good to be the best. Yeah. I I I think that as misleading as it may sound, a lot of people need to hear that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. You I, know, like because it's it's true, and and the more you talk to even you know, our heroes, the more you kind of hear some reflection of that, you know? I remember this interview with Andre 3000. It was actually, it was on Much Music around when Heya came out. And um, 
he was playing pool in the interview with the VJ and they're just like playing pool talking. And then he gets this call from his manager being like, Hey, I just went to number one. And he's like sick. And like, he's talking to the interviewer and the interviewer is like, listen, people are calling you a genius, you know? Cause this is, this was after, you know, all the early outcast albums and Stankonia had bombs over Baghdad, which is like still from the future. And then now, Hey, yeah, like people are calling you a genius. And he said, no, 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 I'm not a genius. I'm not a genius. He's dead serious. He wasn't no false humility. You know? He was being like, no, like I'm not a genius. I know I'm not a genius because I know how hard I work. He said, I just pay attention. He said, I just pay attention. So, you know, even coming from that level, you know, he's like, he's like, it's not, he doesn't see himself as, you know, mm-hmm. some ultra gifted, you know, magical being. He's like, I work really hard and I, and I pay attention. You know, I listen maybe a little bit more than other people listen. I, I'm attentive to what's going on maybe a little bit more, but I'm just a guy working hard at his music. Uh, that's, that's, that's needed because I, I feel like, you know, we, we put a lot of expectations on ourselves in terms of what we think we need to be to become who we want to become. And yeah. often, you know, what, what we think that person looks like or what that person does is not accurate to what that actually takes. So I think that's absolutely, absolutely huge. Um, man, I, I want to thank you for giving us your time and join us on the cool table. I'm happy we went smoothie gang because this is the first time we've done this. This might have to be like a, a ritual. If someone can't do the ice cream, we just show up with our I smoothies. I love it. No, Yo, this, Jeff, was, this was a really great interview. I appreciate it. Um, really great range of questions. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for anyone who's listening for the first time, make sure you go ahead and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. Leave us a rating and a review. Five stars, not a single star less. Follow us on Instagram at The Cool Table Live. Of course, on YouTube at The Cool Table Live. You can listen to The Cool Table every single Wednesday at 11 a.m. on CJRU. 1280 a.m. And of course, until next time, know yourself, know your worth. Yeah.